My name is James Harris. When the events described here took place, I was 52 years old. I was married to the woman I loved. We had two grown children whom we raised properly, and I had a well-paying job that I enjoyed. I had the world by the tail, and life was wonderful. Until it wasn't. It all started on a Tuesday evening. That evening, I worked late, but not so late that my wife would worry. I headed home after rush hour traffic had cleared. It was my typical Tuesday evening. We had agreed that I would pick up some Chinese food on the way home, and that's exactly what I did. I parked in the garage, pressed the remote to close the door, gathered my briefcase and the food, and headed inside. I was like a mighty hunter returning to the cave to feed my hungry mate, or at least what passes for that in 21st century America. Almost immediately, I noticed my wife's car wasn't in its usual spot. I figured she must have stepped out for some last-minute errands and assumed she'd be back soon. So I left the food covered on the kitchen table, hoping to keep it warm, knowing that if she was delayed, we could always reheat it in the microwave. I walked down the hallway to the front door, turned at the staircase, and headed to our bedroom. I changed into something more comfortable. It was my usual weekday routine. Come home, get comfortable, and eat. Ten minutes later, I was coming down the stairs and called out, Mary, are you home? Nothing. I thought, where could she have gone? Maybe she left a note. I wasn't too worried, but by this point, I was at least curious. I went into the living room and found a note on the coffee table. It wasn't the kind of note I was expecting, but it was the kind I could never have imagined. It read, Dear Jim, I'm sorry to do this to you, but there's someone who needs me. I got a call today. It's the kind of call you have to respond to when it comes. I'm sorry I left without warning. I know this will be hard for you, but please know that I love you more than life itself, and I'll come back as soon as I can. I cherish the life we've built together, and I hope to return to it when I can. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. Your loving wife, Mary. On the coffee table next to the letter lay her cell phone. I was stunned and confused. I kept going over what I had read. Her mysterious letter said someone needed her. Who needed her? Who could be so important, yet not worth telling me who they were? Then panic set in. Where had she gone? How could it be so urgent that she couldn't tell me where she was going? How could she leave her phone behind? When would she be able to contact me? This wasn't the kind of note a wife leaves if she's planning to return late in the evening. Panic turned into fear, and fear into anger. How could she do this? She just runs off without properly explaining why and where she's going. Then darker thoughts crept in. The first question, how could she forget her phone? Gave way to a second, why did she leave her phone? I read her note again, and the second time, it told me no more than it had the first. There's someone who needs me. I got a call today. It's the kind of call you have to respond to. Who does she think she is? She's not a secret agent, not a super spy, not a neurosurgeon for the leaders of the free world. Where the hell is my wife? I admit, my anger was a mask for my fear. I was worried about my wife. Wherever she was, I was convinced she would need my help. I wanted to go to her, but where had she gone? I wanted to hear her voice, and know she was okay, but I had no way to reach her. I just sat there, rereading her note, while dinner grew cold and the sun set. When it got dark, I finally decided to start making calls. I called her sister, our friends, and eventually, our children. No one knew anything or would tell me. Worst of all, I ended up just scaring our children. I tried to reassure them that nothing serious had happened, but I didn't do a good job. I hung up, promising to keep them informed. Now I was even angrier, blaming her for scaring our kids, even though I had a hand in that mistake. I reread the note again. I cherish the life we've built together, and hope to return to it when I can. Those aren't the words of someone returning soon. Now, I was truly scared. Though I kept telling myself I was overreacting, I called the hospital. She wasn't there. 
Then I called the police, but they told me I couldn't file a missing persons report until 48 hours had passed, unless I was reporting a missing child. I thought about lying. How could I tell them I wanted to report a child who was 5'8", with chestnut hair, who could pass for 38, even though she was 49? I thanked them and hung up. In the end, I tried to eat something, but I wasn't hungry, so I just put the food in the fridge and sat in the dimly lit living room, hoping she'd come back. She didn't. I went upstairs after 2 a.m. and fell into a deep sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I stretched and realized her side of the bed was cold and empty. It all came flooding back, and I lay there thinking, what should I do? I called work and said I wouldn't be coming in. My absence seemed unusual and caused concern. Soon, my phone was ringing with colleagues asking if I was okay, if I needed anything, or what they should do about certain files. Trying to help them a little felt cleansing, and for a brief moment, distracted me from my worries. I called her office, but they told me she had called in and taken the day off. I didn't think they were hiding anything, although for a while, I suspected that. Over time, I became more convinced they were as much in the dark as I was. I visited her office several times, hoping for more answers, but learned nothing. The police needed 48 hours before I could file a report, so on Friday morning, I went to the police station to report her missing. I showed them her note, and they asked if she had done anything like this before. Yelling at the police isn't a good idea, but I wasn't in the best frame of mind. They threatened to charge me if I didn't calm down, so I forced myself to sit before they decided I was a hot-headed suspect. They filled out the form, then said, In most cases like this, the wife runs off with her boyfriend. You'll probably find out in a few days when you're served with divorce papers. Never in my life had I wanted to punch a police officer so badly. Instead, I just muttered, Thanks for nothing, and walked out. So much for their motto to protect and serve. I went back home and collapsed into a chair, torn apart by stress. With nothing else to do, I resumed calling friends and relatives. But this time, I was smart enough not to call the kids. Instead, they called me, and I had to tell them I still didn't know anything, but I was sure their mother was fine. She's smart, capable, and I was confident she had everything under control. In other words, I was lying to my kids. A father should never lie to his children, but I had nothing to tell them. Nothing good or bad other than that their mother was still missing. How do you have that kind of conversation with your kids, who have every reason to be worried about their mother? My calls on Tuesday triggered a flood of calls to me. The calls started calmly with comments like, just checking in. But by Thursday they grew increasingly concerned. By Friday, the tone of some calls had taken on an unmistakable edge of aggression. No one had said it outright yet, but concern was slowly giving way to accusations. If the calls on Friday were bad, the visits on Saturday were unbearable. I was overwhelmed with visitors, friends and family stopping by to see how I was doing. They always began with words of support, but soon the questions followed. Were there any problems? Did you argue? Was she unhappy? What finally broke me was when her mother asked, Are you sure you don't know where she is? I snapped and yelled at my mother-in-law for the first time since we'd known each other. What kind of crap are you talking, Margaret? Are you accusing me of something? Do you really think I'd lie? No, Jim, of course not. It's just... She hesitated. Spit it out, Margaret. Just what? She looked me in the eye and with an angry glare I will remember until the day I die, said, It's just that she's never done anything like this before. I shoved my anger and pain deep down. Hoping they wouldn't resurface, I said as calmly as I could, Do you think I don't know that? She was visibly shaking, and her husband said, Jim, we know you're doing everything you can. Could you tell us what you know, and maybe we can figure something out? I nodded, then told them everything I knew, or rather, that I knew nothing. I showed them the note, and they were equally puzzled and worried. The thinly veiled accusations disappeared, and we spent an hour shedding tears, 
trying to come up with any explanation for Mary's sudden disappearance, but we had nothing. Henry and Margaret stayed until lunch. I prepared a light meal for the three of us, or at least I thought it was for the three of us. Apparently our friends had other ideas, as there was a constant stream of people at the front door, some bringing food, others bringing beer. Everyone wanted to know what had happened, and what I knew. At some point, I stopped telling the story. That's when Margaret and Henry stepped in. To their credit, the blame was taken off me, and she praised me for being a concerned husband. Deep down, everyone had their own suspicions, but at least it felt like I had regained some support. I was truly overwhelmed as one well-wisher after another sat down with me to express concern. I urged everyone to contact the police if they thought of anything that might help. Secretly, I believed someone knew something they weren't telling me and hoped that information would reach the authorities. As far as I could tell, no one knew anything. Aside from a few supporters who called the police to ask if they had any leads, nothing happened for weeks. That is, nothing happened for exactly two weeks. The police had my wife's driver's license, along with her car's make and model. They added it to their watch list in case of potential thefts. When I remarked, I hope they find her car, maybe they'll find her, people would glance at each other as if I didn't get it. But I did. I knew what they were thinking. She ran away, and there's a good chance she won't want to come home. I tried going back to work, but I was useless there, and everyone told me to go home. So I went home and was just as useless there. I made phone calls, drove around the area looking for her car, and even drove past her friends' houses, thinking maybe they were hiding her, though I couldn't imagine why. Day after day, I worried, called, drove around, and pestered the police, but got nowhere. In a fit of desperation, I reached out to my lawyer to ask what I should do, and he connected me with a private investigator. Officially, the police said it was my right. Unofficially, they didn't like it. They told me private investigators usually interfere and get in the way of official investigations, so I asked, what do you have so far? They had nothing. I told them, in direct language, that I didn't think a private investigator could interfere with them finding nothing. They didn't like that, but they couldn't argue. The private investigator was expensive and came back with exactly what the police had. Nothing. As I mentioned, this happened two weeks after Mary disappeared. I was still making phone calls, driving around, and watching the news. I also started checking Mary's social media. I monitored her credit card activity and our bank accounts. There was nothing on the card until two weeks later, when money was withdrawn from an ATM in a town 200 miles away. I immediately called the police and informed them. This caught their attention, and within half an hour, two detectives were at my door. The suspicion started again. Finally, I looked them in the eyes and said calmly, but on the verge of rage, no, I didn't go there and I didn't use that card. I've been here in town the whole time, calling friends, driving around, and doing more than any of you. They left to investigate the lead. The local police passed the information about Mary and her car along. Two days later, her car was found in a hospital parking lot. The local police called me and said, Don't do anything. Let us handle it. I responded, like hell, and drove there myself. Just over three hours later, I arrived. I found her car in two minutes, though it felt like two hours. I noticed two men in suits sitting in a car nearby, clearly police. I approached them, showed my license, and asked to see their badges. They complied reluctantly, and I knelt beside them to ask what they knew, but they only knew about the car. When I said I was going to ask about my wife, they informed me that they had already asked. I thanked them with fake sincerity and did it anyway. At the hospital reception, they had no information about Mary, so I decided to join the stakeout. I asked to sit in the back seat of their car, surprising them. They agreed. Over the next hour, we talked, and I told them what little I knew. When their shift ended, they agreed to let me watch the car, but made it clear. If someone comes for the car, 
do not intervene. Just call us. I nodded. Understood, I replied. I finally felt like I understood my role. I went back to my car, and for the next three hours, I sat hunched in the seat, watching Mary's car. The only time I left my post was for a quick bathroom break. An hour later, I saw a woman approaching the car, and my heart stopped. I tried to catch my breath. It was Mary. She opened the car door. She took out something small, then closed it and headed back toward the hospital. I followed her, keeping my distance. Something told me that if she knew I was here, I'd never get the truth. I watched as she entered the elevator, which stopped on the third floor. I peeked into a room. I saw her sitting by a man's bedside, holding his hand. I cleared my throat, and when she turned and saw me standing in the doorway, my beloved wife fainted. I was angry and confused, but called a nurse to attend to her. I spent most of the time studying the man in the bed. I had never seen him before. He was neither a friend nor a relative, just a man. But it was clear that to Mary, he was more important than her marriage, more important than her family, and apparently more important than me. One mystery was solved, but another had just begun. When the nurse helped Mary, I called the detectives. I told them Mary had been found, providing the room number. Life was getting interesting, and as I looked at the man in the bed, I felt a cold chill where fear used to be. When Mary came to, she was hysterical, shaking her head as I asked questions. Who is this man? Why did you run off like that? She seemed about to answer, but then she would lower her head and, and cry again. I waited, asking questions, wondering when the detectives would arrive. When they did, I stepped aside and let them take over. They asked me to leave the room, and one detective joined me, asking a dozen questions. I just told the truth. I saw Mary approach the car, followed her, and confronted her in the hospital room. Confronted might not have been the best word, and I spent the next five minutes assuring him I hadn't harmed her. When he learned the nurse found Mary lying on the floor, the questioning intensified. I convinced them I hadn't harmed Mary, or maybe she did. I don't know. They wanted me to leave, so I called out, Mary, if I walk out, I'm divorcing you. Do you understand? She begged me not to leave. I then told the detective, I'm not going anywhere until I get answers. Eventually, I was allowed back into the room. Quietly and calmly, I began asking Mary questions that had burned in my mind. Mary gave vague, half-answers. The man was her high school boyfriend, her first love. He was dying, and he had no one. But there were long pages of information left unsaid. How have you been living here for two weeks without using your card? She was silent, then replied. I've been staying at his house. I asked. So you know where he lives? She nodded. And you have a key? She nodded again. How long have you had a key to his house? She shrugged, silent. I knew that accusing her could be risky, but two weeks was too long to wait for answers. How long, Mary? She didn't respond. How long has the affair been going on? She didn't answer nor deny the accusation. My mind went quiet. I knew more pain was coming. All right, I said. At the very least, you should show me his house. I want to see where you've been staying. She looked terrified, but finally nodded. I told her I'd drive. As we drove, Mary remained mostly silent, speaking only when necessary to give directions. At one point, she whispered, we might have to compensate the police for the time they've wasted. I wanted to ask, who is this we you're talking about? But I stayed silent. My pulse and blood pressure were likely sky high. I could barely stand as we reached the townhouse. I realized that inside, I'd likely find answers to my questions. Mary led us into the house, and I noticed her shoes by the sofa and her favorite scarf draped over a chair. I started down the hallway when Mary called out, James, please don't go in there. Her words had the opposite effect. I walked into the bedroom. Mary's clothes were scattered on the bed and chair, her makeup on the dresser. When I opened the closet and saw familiar dresses, 
My last doubts vanished. This was her home away from home. I returned to the living room, feeling shattered, finding Mary sitting quietly. So, is there anything you want to tell me? She shook her head. How long, Mary? It's obvious this isn't platonic. How long? She shrugged, as if unsure. Who is he to you? She was silent, then said. He was my first. We were together in school. I wondered if she meant high school or college. How long have you been seeing him behind my back? Mary flinched but couldn't deny it. We reconnected about seven years ago. At first, it was lunches, then dinners. One evening, when you were out of town, we went dancing. That was about a year before we... She trailed off. Before you had sex, she nodded slowly. So you've been sleeping with him behind my back for six years? I asked. Did you come here, or did he come to our house? Mary's head snapped up. I never brought him to our house. I swear I would never do that to you. I nodded, feeling anger rise. So you can sleep with him, but not in our home. Glad to know there's a line you won't cross. She got angry, but couldn't deny it. I never stopped loving you, she insisted. He never took anything away from you. It was a lie. He took at least part of your love, I countered. You kept part of your heart for him, lied to me, broke vows, and gave yourself to him. Mary started crying. I stood silently beside her, realizing I had all the answers I needed. I thought about wrecking his house, but it seemed pointless. I just gave up. Let's go, Mary. I'll take you back to the hospital. She cried again, but I had no comfort left to offer. I drove her back, and as she got out, she begged, James, please, give me a little more time. He has no one. I can't let him die alone. I'll be home soon. The last sentence ended in a sob. I'll be home soon, and we can go back to our life together. Please, I love you. I nodded silently, then drove away. It was over between us. I drove home slowly, covering 200 miles without telling anyone. Two weeks of stress and worry had culminated in betrayal. I collapsed into my favorite chair. It wasn't long before the first call came. From her parents. They wanted to know where I'd been. I briefly considered sparing Mary the embarrassment, but I must have used up the last remnants of love for her. I told Henry and Margaret everything. They didn't want to believe it until I described what I found in his house. At that point, it didn't matter. My marriage was over. I knew it deep down. Mary had loved another man, and I wasn't someone who shared. Worse yet, she'd lied to me for years. We couldn't go back. I called her friends and told them everything, restraining my anger. After using them as practice, I called our children, gently but honestly telling them I'd found their mother with her lover. They didn't want to believe it either, so I described the townhouse. They asked if I could forgive her. Maybe someday, I replied, but I'll never trust her again. I apologized, but told them I was divorcing their mother. I also explained that Mary needed the remaining time to be with him, and rushing home wouldn't change anything. They argued, but eventually understood. Two weeks later, he died and Mary returned home. But I was no longer there. A week later, she was served with divorce papers. I hadn't left town, quit my job, or hidden from her. I had just moved into an apartment. Mary tried to change my mind, but my decision was final. It lasted for six years. Six years of betrayal. The lying, at least as much as the sex, destroyed our marriage. When I realized how easily she had lied to me with a smile, I knew she didn't see me with the same loyalty. It's been two years since the divorce. I don't ask, but the kids say Mary just works and goes home. She doesn't go out, or so they think. I feel sad that she's suffering, but I can't help her. To this day, I don't know if she mourns the loss of her first love or our marriage. As for me, I'm not doing great either. I haven't healed, but the pain is fading slowly. I'm not dating, but I started noticing other women. I suspect that in time, I'll try dating again. I'm far from trusting another woman, but I'll try. 
I'll never know why Mary betrayed me, what she was missing, or how she justified it. I suppose I could ask, but what's the point? It was her decision, and she came to terms with it somehow. I never learned his name, just a man on his death, and a townhouse where Mary played house. That was enough for me. You can't get revenge on the dead, and I couldn't forgive the wife who betrayed me. No elaborate twists, no revenge, just pain, doubt, and the feeling of failure. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.